afternoon. Uh, my name is Chris Loring. I'm the director of the libraries here at Smith, and it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to today's talk by Beth Myers, our recently installed director of special collections. Beth has been with us for just over six months, uh, and that's just long enough for it to be just the right time for her to provide us with her vision for special collections here at Smith. Beth came to us from Wayne State University where she was the leader of the Walter P. Ruther Library of Labor and Urban Affairs, the largest um, history, labor history archive in North America. So she's going from one very big archive to another. Prior to her position at uh, the Ruther, she served as director of the Women and Leadership Archives at Loyola University at Chicago. And she did that for six years. Beth holds a PhD from Loyola University uh, in 20th century US history with concentrations in women's history and public history. She, well, Beth has been rocketing through her career uh, in archives. She's also been very active in the world of archivists. Uh, she's, on the advise she's an advisory committee member of the Archives Leadership uh, Institute and the Women's Archivist Roundtable. She has served on numerous professional committees uh, in the Society of American Archivists and the Midwest Archives Concentration and the Chicago Area Women's History Consortium. With all this background, this position at Smith for Beth is a dream job. It marries her love of history of and of women's history in particular and her love of archives and her skills as a leader. We in the libraries, and I in particular, are thrilled she joined us in May. Beth's today's talk is what does the future hold for the past in visiting Smith College collections. The position of director of special collections is a new one for the libraries. Um, we created it to provide overall leadership uh, for our incredible special collections. Leadership, of course, has uh, many, many facets, but among them, at a day-to-day -day level, it means making sure we organize and do our work so that it benefits Smith and the scholarly community um, at the highest level possible. Beth has very much begun to provide us with that leadership. At a strategic level, it means in visiting the future, knowing where we want to be in the future and where we need to be in the future. And then helping Smith make the right choices for special collections now so we get to that future. This afternoon, uh, we'll hear Beth talk about that future. After her talk, there'll be a reception with food, and I hope you can stay around and have a little something to eat and drink and get to talk to uh, Beth individually. We'll also have some time for questions after her uh, presentation. So now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Beth. I'm going to start my timer to see exactly how bad I blow <laughs> my schedule. Um, thank you, Chris, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Some of it uh, you'll hear again here as I go through my presentation. And thank you for coming. There are so many um, familiar and friend and colleague faces in this room. And to those of you I don't know, I'm sure I'll get the chance to. But thank you for taking time out of your schedules. Uh, to come and hear me talk this evening. I do appreciate it. And um, I would also say in the Q&A and reception that follows, there are a large number of special collection staff here in the room. Um, and so you can seek any one of them out um, to answer uh, questions you might have about the important work that we do. So thank you for coming. Um, this particular talk on my vision for the future of Smith's special collections. And in thinking about this presentation, and in particular the title, I tried every way I could think of not to use the word vision or visionary. Um, not just because of the pressure that it puts on one person, uh, but also because according to the Oxford English Dictionary, one of the principal definitions of vision is of ha possessing farsightedness. And for those of us who have long found our comfort in wrestling with and dwelling in the past 
in history. Uh, reading the tea leaves of the future isn't exactly our most comfortable uh, milieu. At the same time, undoubtedly, this moment is an auspicious one for special collections broadly defined as a profession and for special collections here at Smith. We are all in transition, grappling with a pivot towards um, broad service and outreach thinking, community and activist engagement on in levels not dreamed of 15 or 20 years ago, and wrestling with mammoth technological changes even as the everyday work of what we do goes on. And in fact, the everyday work of what we do has been affected by all of those things. So it is at this moment that I've been asked to introduce myself to give context to who I am and the work that we do here and to offer some predictions, if not aspirations, which I'm much more comfortable with, of Smith's special collections. There's a keyboard, hang on. There we go. As some of you know, I am a classic, or I rather, I'm classically trained as a historian. I came out of the prodigious, certainly prolific history program at Loyola University Chicago, where I studied under cultural historian Louis Ehrenberg and uh, women and labor historian Susan Hirsch. Um, luckily for me, they were and remain a married couple, so getting my form signed was actually pretty easy. That was nice. Um, but more importantly, they were mentors to me um, in a very profound way, and I credit them and have done so before and will do so again um, in teaching me how to live a life of the mind without forgetting the spirit. Um, under or at Loyola, under the tutelage of Lou and Sue, among other influential faculty to my professional career, I learned the arduous practice of historiography. I wrestled with numerous research methodologies, some successfully, some not so much. And ultimately, I discovered what it meant to encounter the raw stuff of history as a would-be academic, or rather as an in-training academic, getting to encounter that unedited and raw stuff. Now for me, in my case, the sporadic um, and rather unpredictable joy of discovery often overshadowed or, and certainly outweighed what, let's be fair, could say the tedium of research at times and certainly the occasional heartbreak when a question that you have goes unanswered because the sources aren't there. But most importantly, doing research for myself taught me three important things. First, that history is, of course, defined by the existing record. It is not guessing or supposition like any rigorous science, social science, or practice. It, it, it demands an anchor and a root. For us, that may be in an object or an artifact. It might be in something, in the spoken word. Two, archives as portals for the production of history are not passive and objective. Instead, they are active and subjective with wonderful and, historically speaking, terrible consequences. What do I mean by terrible consequences? So you think there's no drama in the archives, but there is. We all know about those unintentional silences created in the record because of something getting chucked into the trash because someone didn't think it was important or because it, there was a flood, or because there was mold, or worse, bugs. We've seen it all. Those create silences in the record, but also silences have been intentionally created in the record because certain voices, certain people were not valued. So we have gaping holes that we try actively to fix. So given all this mucking around in the records that I was doing and the, how these sort of profound kind of epiphanies were occurring to me through my work, by the time I defended my dissertation, I think somewhat to the chagrin of my advisors, I knew that my path was not towards a tenure track uh, position, should I even have been so lucky to find one, but rather in the direction of professional archivist. At the time, I had no idea what that meant, none. Archivists were these creatures who moved mysteriously with encyclopedic knowledge about the world, and I just liked them a lot. But I didn't really know what it meant to be a professional archivist, but I was determined to find out. As a slight backstory, one thing you should know about me is that um, I like to be busy. I thrive off of it, and so there are many parallels. So what you'll hear me say as I proceed through this little trip through my biography is, um, and at the same time, so here's one of my first at the same time. 
Um, I had also, by, while sort of training in graduate school and doing graduate work, I had also been working in special collections and archives, cutting my teeth in various uh, special collections, historic homes, and historical societies going back to 2001. But it wasn't until the cold, and this is Chicago, so honestly, cold, cold months of February 2007 that I was named, much to my own surprise, director of the Women in Leadership Archives at Loyola. I was what you call a lone arranger. See, archivists are funny, I get it? <laughs> um, and a lone arranger is because I was the only full-time staff person there, which required me to wear many hats, and it was a brilliant learning experience. Um, working with donors, building collections, working with collection discovery and systems and exhibits and um, certainly when and where in my meager way I could support the mission of the university, that's what I tried, tried to do. Now, my education as an archivist was at first very practical, but after 2007 it also became academic and passionate. It took, I took it upon myself to read, study, learn, and listen, attend every archival conference I could, and though it might be said of me today, certainly then there wasn't a committee I didn't want to volunteer for. In this process, it was about getting involved, joining up, and engaging in a rigorous professional community that had been in existence for a long time. I had a lot of catch up to do. I certainly learned the theory. I was able to put it into practice and get to know the profession and amazing people who comprised it at the same time, dot, dot, dot. Because of Loyola's commitment to training graduate students as well as teachers, uh, as academics as well as teachers, I also had been teaching in the history department since 2003. For years I picked up a class or two as they want to do and, and for the graduate student support eventually moving from core courses to upper division and finally graduate level courses um, after I earned my own PhD. From 2008 to 2012, I was lucky to teach in a kind of accidentally interdisciplinary way. What I mean by that is I balanced teaching archives and archival administration for the public history master's program with teaching the senior capstone courses for women's studies and gender studies which included feminist research methodology and the history of feminist thought. What a dream. I was at the intersection of my three loves, research, archives, and feminism. I felt so at home, and it was a gift to have that time. And perhaps more importantly, it really did deepen my understanding of research and practice, the intersection of individual knowledge and how our delivery systems encourage knowledge building. Also, how research methods exist, whether we're conscious of them or not, and certainly the pivotal role that archives play in the, in the connection between the researcher and the stuff. So it's this three-pronged training that was really over 10 years in the making that gave me the confidence and desire to further my career as an archivist, first by moving to the Ruther Library, which has a very long title, so I'll skip the rest, um, and before moving here to join the remarkable staff of Smith College. I've said it before and will do so again, there is absolutely no other job that could have induced me to leave the Ruther other than coming here as Director of Special Collections. But it was not only the right job, it was the right job at the right time. You knew there was going to be a cat, right? <laughs> I had to get the cat in there. So as I've noted earlier, special collections, which is really, in my thinking, um, a constellation of professions here, which includes rare books, college archives, and the Sophia Smith collection, is dramatically changing and growing. Speaking specifically to archives, there are now over 6,000 members of the Society of American Archivists, and that's just people who are willing to pay the dues. That's an all-time high from its founding in 1936. Similar growth trends exist for our cousins in digital humanities, textual studies, and museum studies. So when I get told that the humanities is on the ropes, I shrug my shoulders and say, that's not what I'm seeing. Ultimately, we have grown from a profession of quietly proud introverts to one that also includes, and we still have quietly proud introverts, <laughs> but one that also includes dynamically engaged information managers and collaborators. We seek our audiences in active ways, all of which have been transformed in, uh, really by technology.
archivists and curators have long been obsessed with access. Without access, there's no point. You might as well store it in a U-Haul, lock it, and walk away. What makes us unique, what makes us necessary, is that we are mediators of content. We make sense out of the chaos, and we bring it in nicely, ideally, packaged boxes and acid-free folders, and we care for it in a way that makes sure that it's going to be there for hundreds of years, or in perpetuity, whatever comes first. So access is our primary goal. We want you to use the stuff, but we've had to seriously adjust and rethink exactly what access means to us, to our known users, as well as to untapped potential users. Access is not defined solely as a place any longer, but rather it's conceived as multispatial. What follows in this slide and the next is a very brief overview of some of the really cool highlights of what's happening in the profession. I don't bring these to you to brag abstractly about what other people are doing or enviously, but rather I think there are lessons here for us to look to for ourselves, to think about what of these things might make sense here at Smith. So when thinking about access and spatial and multispatial access at that, it's not about abandoning the reading room. People still need to have the tactile experience with the stuff we will not be able to digitize everything, and I'm sure as many of you in this audience know, not, not everything is online. Nor, to be honest, do we want everything online. There is still something to be said for that moment when the student or the user sits down with the stuff for the first time and is able to handle something that's either 10 years old or 200 years old, and it's just simply a different process of learning. And that's something we want to encourage, as well as, though, think about and challenge the ways that reading rooms are spaces for everyone and different learning types. And this is where I think we can um, look to our future renovation of the library um, as an opportunity to thinking about our, our actual research space. Similarly, in instruction, Sorry, I have a lot of links and I think I'm gonna to have to shave a few off. Um, but thinking about instruction too, um, we have professionally sought um, a, a much closer and obvious tie to curriculum at various institutions. I think for people in special collections, we have always seen our connection to the curriculum, but now it's being made in a very visible way by the massive increase, really exponential growth in students coming into the archives as well as us going out to meet them where they're at. The lines between re instruction, reference, discovery, and outreach really are blurring, largely due to things like, of course, technology. There are a few really good examples I can't help but, but skip. All right, I don't want to skip, rather. Let's see if this works. Come on. There we go. Including recognizing that discovery portals aren't necessarily happening through websites, but people want to be able to use, access their content wherever they are, including on their phone. So we have um, growing, I wouldn't say robust, but a growing interest in app development for special collections and archival content, including this one from the Internet Archive. And there's another one, and Martin, this one's for you, that just came to my attention, which is a medieval handwriting transcription um, app that allows you to look at different fonts from the 15th <coughs> century and um, see the translations. And I do not have time to go into them, but they're worth checking out. I've kind of gotten obsessed with this one, by the way, even though I can't read any of it, but it's still, um, come on, there we go. Also, in terms of taking the archives out and thinking of access differently, outreach. Um, the profession itself has become more robust about engaging people, not necessarily within the confines of four walls. One really cool way this has happened is you may or may not know that archives is, um, October is archives month. We have a whole month, it's a good month. Um, and on the 30th is a event called um, Ask an Archivist. So anybody, anywhere can tweet in questions, archivists can talk to each other, and I wasn't able to sit on this all day because I was working, but um, when I was able to check in, there was a really, really fun and robust conversation that was happening, and it was clear there were people who had never been in an archive but had archival questions, and so it was a place to create that kind of spark. <laughs> Another one I would call your attention to briefly is the Oregon Archives Crawl, which frankly is one of my favorite, not just because it's modeled after a pub crawl, 
which it is. But it does take the idea of deconstructing archives out of uh, institutional space. So what you can see here, they had over 800 visitors at three host locations um, that visit that um, where the archivist went there. They went to the host locations. They didn't wait. They didn't expect 800 people to go to 30 host locations. They went to centralized locations, and, um, and it was a very it was a very successful event. Plus, again, see, archivists have a sense of humor, honestly. Another aspect um, that I think is closely related to the access question is around a usability. And we as a profession are getting much more interested in how um, people view us, how people access the content. Is it effective? Are we only creating websites for ourselves? Are we only um, speaking to ourselves in the jargon and the language that we use? And so there has been a real just um, fascinating um, uh, explosion is probably an exaggeration, but there certainly has been a growth in the number of institutions using technology in order to assess how well we're doing what we're doing. A really brilliant example of this, I don't have time to show you, is from um, the Museum of Art at the Smithsonian, where they used um, screen share and picture in picture to observe users doing searches off their website. So they were able to watch as people grew increasingly frustrated because they couldn't find what they were looking for, where the professionals sat back and said, oh, well, why aren't they clicking on X or why aren't they clicking on Y? I totally know how to find that, but it wasn't clear for the users. So that picture-in-picture -picture function, the PIP, enabled empathy to develop for us to say we're not here just talking to ourselves. We're here to, to make sure that we are serving a wider community, and it's really an interesting study that uh, was recently written up about it as well. So technology is transforming access and it's contributing to this, di this idea of archives and archivists everywhere. Now here again I would apologize, I do mean archivists and curators everywhere. I use archivists as a sort of professional habit, a personal habit, but I do mean it to be a very inclusive term. Um, because uh, this idea of community engagement, co-creation, partnerships and collaboration, even thinking about information as activism is something that we're all engaged in. I don't have time to click through all of these. I really wish I would, but some of them you certainly know, including Wikipedia projects. Uh, Mount Holyoke really blazed the trail on this. Um, particular project, but there have been others at UMass just here in the valley. We sort of stuck our big toe in and I think we're going to come back to that water soon, uh, which is exciting. Um, in particular because of course Wikipedia does not have um, as many entries about women or women's topics and it does not have as many uh, women editors who are, who are building content. So this is one of those powerful ways in which information translates to its own form of activism and challenging the very idea of what Wikipedia is. Similarly, oral histories can take place inside of the archives, certainly, but it's really about going out into the field and engaging with people who are either whose stories are essential to add context to what we have or to just create any story or any history at all. And so it's out, and of course you need not look any further than the, um, than the trailblazing efforts of the Voices of Feminine, Feminism Project right here in the Sophia Smith Collection. Zines, similarly, our peers, um, our, come on, there we go. Our peers at Barnard did this um, just super fun and, and really kind of brave and interesting. Um, you couldn't get more public than public transportation going on to MTA trains and creating zines in motion with people, co-creating, documenting the process, um, as a, not just as an exercise, but really as its own form of, again, um, information as activism, or certainly information in action. There are uh, really robust examples of, of um, archival um, or archives that exist entirely outside of the institution. The most robust example, and Elizabeth Caron was, gets credit for reminding me of this one, if this mouse will behave, which is the interference archive right down the way, um, which is entirely run by volunteers who are seeking to document social activism and the, the, um, the moment of um, cultural production in activism. And while I can't say that the Interference Archives has turned the whole profession on its ear, they have given us some really important and interesting lessons about how to connect to people about building their own history, to not always serve as the holder, the controller, um, the vessel through which the production happens, which is, um, I think, a lesson that's important to us all. 
Other examples include Archivists Without Borders, which I think I'm running a little long on, so I will skip, but it's exactly what you think it is. Um, there are about a, a baker's dozen chapters um, right now of, of wonderful volunteer people who go out into the U.S. and globally to work with culturally at-risk records. Again, it's not about the institution so much as it about the activism. So here we are at a time in which archives are increasingly comfortable with the deconstruction of the authority of the archivist, as well as to some extent the institutions they may or not belong to. It's really about engagement, not necessarily ownership. And those collaborations are often expressed in what I think of as the collaboratory model, a phrase I'm sorry to say fell out of vogue and was replaced by digital humanities. I like collaboratory model. Why it takes collaboration and laboratory, smushes it together, gets to that test kitcheny vibe that I think is probably more descriptive about what happens when you think about a history pin website, for example, or the um, citizen archivist dashboard um, that the National Archives run, where the public is asked to contribute actively and on an ongoing way uh, to create history that they're documenting. Help us transcribe. Help us upload your photographs. Tell us your stories. This isn't about a scale of scholarship being higher or lower. It's a collaborative building process. But of course, digital humanities has brought us a new sort of age of scholarship in different ways. I think we have, as archivists and curators are challenged to maintain those deep connections to those who are producing the book and producing the article and going through the rigors of peer review, but even at the same time recognizing that our definition of scholarship in the 21st century is expanding and growing and contracting in different ways. I think it's becoming more fluid. Even the idea of who's an archivist, who has a right, is a very different concept than it used to be. Instead, I think it's more productive to think of us as learning communities, collaborators and peers, without necessarily the same levels of definition. So what does all this mean for Smith? It's impossible for me to highlight all the amazing things that are being done here and now. And many of the people in this, there are several of the people in this room are doing this work. So apologies if I don't call out your particular task or contribution. There's so many things it's, it would be impossible to do so. But certainly I do want to frame in a quad kind of way. Here's Nielsen, right? Um, so I got the quad reference going. Okay, so I do want to frame this in a way that sort of says this is sort of what's sitting around us and also what we're doing inside. And of course, there isn't anything bigger or more important to us moving forward than really the renovation of our space. We are imagining, we are dreaming, we are planning, we are advocating for an archival space that is in uh, welcome and expandable in the 21st century, that's flexible in the way that we know learning spaces are becoming flexible. They're not rigid and they're not um, very, very narrowly defined. We need to, see, again, seeking our users where they're at, not one single learning style. Also to acknowledge the amount of instruction that we are doing and how technology has changed our work and workflows as well as to a certain extent our relationship to the library as a whole. But within the sort of physical space that we are in and then aspire to, um, there are many digital projects taking place. The Medieval Manuscript Scriptorium project from the Rare Books I believe is wrapping up and entering its final stages, as well as the Seven Siblings Digital Portal project focusing now on college archives material, perhaps others as it moves from pilot to permanent. We continue to engage in AV preservation and conservation efforts are always ongoing. Got to get that stuff off the VHS tapes. Doesn't last forever. We do our digit digitization on demand or on order for researchers. Few people want photocopies anymore. And of course we support digital humanities initiatives here at the college that facilitate online learning in many different forms. We continue to engage in ongoing professional development such as hosting groups like the Digital Power here at Smith that recognizes we are all digital archivists. I'm a firm believer in this. I don't believe one is a digital archivist or you're an archivist. You are simply an archivist and you deal with all kinds of stuff. Some of which is creepy, some of which is funny, some of which is in physical form, and some of which is in bits and bytes. We do have a robust social media presence, which is a shout out in particular to College Archives, which has the most popular Facebook following. Uh, it's not a competition. Um, and it gets um, reposted frequently from the college and college libraries, so we thank you for that. 
In terms of instruction, um, we have grown exponentially. Uh, over the last few years, we've averaged over 90 class visits in special collections, including Sophia Smith, College Archives, and Rare Books. That means one in five Smith students is finding their way to special collections, often as repeat visitors. That means a 67% increase of connection to students over, that time, over the 10-year time period. We are always seeking ways to support the curriculum, to expand student and faculty use and access to materials, and key partners in this are the archives concentration and the book studies concentration. Similarly, in programming and partnerships, we will continue to offer exceptional programming, such as the outstanding um, exhibit on the third floor in the book gallery featuring Robert Seidel which was um, put together by the Rare Book staff, but also looking to new partnerships as they grow, including the Gloria and Wilma Center, working title, and, uh, which is just very nearly taking flight. And we're so excited to, to see this outgrowth of um, archival interest and in programming and what Joyce Filet very appropriately puts into phrase of history into action. So wonderful partnerships that we're doing all of which are bound on the other end by collection stewardship. Always looking to expand our collection strengths as well as working towards access and thinking critically about collecting in the future. What will people want to look at? Who's not being documented? Where are the silences? What work do we have ahead of us still? But if you would ask me what comes next, what are those aspirations that I'm so hesitant to sort of throw down on? Well, okay, let me put my money where my mouth is. It's good to have an awareness of our peers, and it's good to recognize the hard work that we're doing. But when thinking about the future, we must always ask ourselves, what makes sense here? What's right for Smith? What's right for our collections? What's right for our users? And so I broke these into three categories, infrastructure, access, and partnerships. And now I'm going to get kind of declaratory. I might pound the podium a little bit. I apologize ahead of time. The first, in infrastructure, we will create a uniform collection management system with our partners in DSS and IT. We will seek an increasingly sophisticated, not complicated, sophisticated and interoperable discovery tools for our collections and working with our partners in discovery and access to do so. We will continue to build our mastery of digital content stewardship because we are all digital archivists now. We will continue to build our collections, especially those related to emerging scholarship and pedagogy and those that correct silences in the record. Oh, we will attack the backlog full on. We will reduce the total number of collections that are unprocessed or unaccessible due to their condition. And we will seek stream ways to streamline our workflows, increase staffing and resources that makes all of that work possible. We will engage in a building renovation process fully and tenaciously so that we get the space that we want for the future archival program. Just getting warmed up. In terms of access, we will continue to build a sustainable and ideally expanded instruction program, including exploratory um, models that we're learning from our, our partners in teaching, learning, and research. Uh, yes, teaching, learning, and research here in the libraries, student and faculty collaborative teaching methods, as well as how can we better use hardware and software in the process of instruction. We will develop additional ways to connect Smith students to the stuff in the classroom and beyond, wherever they may be, through our partners in the concentrations, but also through our existing and expanding internships, work study, mentorships, and assignments. We will, we will expand our social media presence. I don't know how, but we will in a way that makes sense for us and that is strategic. Maybe that's wikis, maybe that's, I don't know, Instagram. I don't know, we just, we have to look at it. But we will expand our presence because it's about access and information. We will continue to build our incredible collection of oral histories and develop further strategic projects in that area that are unique to Smith. And we will assist the college in new and emerging teaching areas like blended learning uh, and digital humanities. 
we will, we will engage in usability studies because we need to hold the mirror up to ourselves to understand what we're doing well and what we could be doing better. And we will be engaging in technology every step of the way because that is just the truth in which we are all, the world in which we are all living. And in closing, we will continue to build and collaborate in our partners that are existing and growing and emerging. We will continue to partner with students, not just as researchers, but as history makers and as generators of content, as our peers and collaborators. We will engage and continue to engage with faculty to support, again, those emerging fields of inquiry, but also the existing fields. What do you need from us, and how can we better serve you and your research needs? And of course, to alumna, so that we can continue to expand our support of your history and the documentation of this historic community. And I hesitate to throw the library on there because we are part of the library. It's not a partner. It is, it is the envelope with which we sit. And yet at the same time, for special collections at this moment in time, we will be joining the library fully and recognizing as much as our librarian friends have to teach us, we've got some, th some things to teach back. And ultimately, this is my vision for the future of Smith Special Collections. And it's big and it's bold. And we're going to get there because we must. So thank you for coming to my talk this evening. Thank you. with other uh, sectors of the Smith College campus. As a committed feminist and committed to women's history, I'm sure there are people who also want to learn about men, but let's put that aside. Your responsibility is women, and that's the special, you know, in terms of women's history. How, how do you anticipate uh, handling that particular tension, and where do issues of transgender documents fit into the definition for you of doing women's history collecting? So that's question one. Question two is, since I'm a University of Massachusetts faculty member, how do you uh, anticipate your relationship with the archivists of the other five campuses? Um, I have no idea what kind of collaboration goes on. Do you have a division of labor? Do you decide, well, Mount Holyoke will collect there, University of Massachusetts will collect there, and you come to a consensus so that you don't step on each other's feet? Um, or how does that go on? And how does that build what is a vital five-college archival community as we attract graduate students to a five-college history degree program? Our mm -hmm. master's degree, as you know, and our doctorate degree, doctor, our five-college degrees depending heavily on the collaboration of all archivists in the area. So I'm very curious how you see the future in both of those categories. Sure, um, so let me address the first one. Um, from Smith is, I'll make the claim, I think it's the largest, certainly the oldest and most diverse women's history collection um, in the, represented, embodied by the Sophia Smith collection. But there are men in the collection um, as well, which is important to remember. But it is focused upon um, women, women's institutions, and organizations. Um, so the Sophia Smith collection is now under the larger umbrella of special collections, and so with college archives, which also is about the mission of women, um, though, of course, because of faculty and administrative papers includes men. Um, and then, of course, Rare Books, which is, um, has uh, some strengths in, um, with the Plath and Wolf and, and other women's, and Ann Martin and other women's collections. Um, the books themselves um, are gender agnostic, I would say. I mean, it's, a, the, it's not the focus. So we do have to mediate this tension. I'm not sure I would even call it a tension. Um, for me, there's, there's no competition between the three. It's the uniqueness of each collection that is what makes them shine. Um, and no one is interested in disrupting that. Um, what we're seeking here, what I am seeking here, is to make the work we do 
um, easier for our users to get to and easier for our faculty to get to, um, easier uh, for preservation purposes of migration, all these sort of things, the sort of system that sits around it um, is the place where we find our common ground. Um, there won't, there's not a bleeding of collections. Um, so, and in that way, I don't, I don't necessarily feel any tension. Insofar as collecting trans papers, we do have um, some, some papers that get to uh, sexuality, issues of sexual identity and gender identity. But we are wrestling with that question too. And it is one of my objectives with the new year, because we're working on some other stuff for the fall, but with the new year for us to engage in a rigorous collection development policy review, which I think every archival institution should be doing at regular intervals and we're kind of due anyway. But this is one of the central questions that we'll be working with and, and, and talking about as, as a group. Um, and finally, the five colleges. Yes, um, the five colleges is a robust partner and their omission from this presentation was for time, um, not for anything else. Um, the, there is a special collections, five college special collections group that sits with the, underneath the auspices of the uh, five college librarians group. There are many digital, uh, also digital um, um, collaborative committees, working groups. Um, there's a lot of talk about where we can collaborate is that in, um, in a shared facility, shared positions, is it, um, you know, how do, we, how do we work together in an efficient way so we're not repeating the same process over and over to everyone's expense. But also, I think within this idea of collection and competition, I do think that collecting in the past for archives and perhaps for an institution here or there is still true, was really more of a blood sport. Uh, it was cutthroat and it was cruel at times. I do think, I hope, and what I advocate for is transparency in the collection development of what we do and to engage, to me, that's a feminist expression, um, to engage in non-competitive collecting that recognizes we can't take it all, nobody can take it all, and, not, and care for it responsibly. Um, and there's no reason for us to compete. We all have different strengths. Let's le recognize what those are. To that point, I've spent um, a bit of time on the road in my last six months visiting each of the five colleges and making a trip to Schlesinger, and I hope to hit Duke before too long, probably not this year, but maybe next year, um, as well, and I've been to the Iowa Women's Archives, so I want to know, and I'm asking, what are you collecting? What are you interested in? Where are you going? How can we work together? And everybody has been gracious and open in their responses. So I think we are in an age of collaboration and not competition. the Google effect. We would have a single place for users to go, which would open up to them the entire world of the archive. If not necessarily digital content or facsimiles or surrogates, then it would certainly tell them where to go to get access to the, to the actual stuff. Right now we have um, sort of competing places where that information uh, is located and it's difficult, I think, to find. Um, and so w I think we have to simplify and yet behind, behind simplification is always sophistication. Like Google isn't simple, right? So when people say the Google effect, it's sort of, you look down, one could look down their nose at it, but what's sitting behind it is incredibly complicated. That's the sort of experience I want to deliver so that our users don't have to look in multiple places. They go to one place and they can find it. That's my dream. And I think it's achievable. And we're, right now we're interviewing for a, a position, a metadata and technical services position, and um, you know, really sort of putting into place um, and the existing staff, what, what do we need to get to that? Um, we're taking those steps right now. Yes, please. Or about your vision of special collections in the renovated library, which is supposed to have a, a new, prominent, much more prominent role. 
Yes, I couldn't be more excited um, about the new building, and it's and it's um, one of many reasons, but certainly within like a top five of why I came here. And the people and the collections were higher, but the new building um, is 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 a once in a, a lifetime, once in a career opportunity, and um, we have beautiful spaces. If you've been to the rare book room, you know it's classic design and its orderliness it's, is modernism is appealing very much to me personally. The alumni gym holds its own unique charm. It's a, a, a inspiring space that's also warm. How do you do that? I mean, there aren't many spaces that can balance those things where you feel like you've come home and yet it's this big, giant space. Our spaces are good spaces, but we've outgrown them not in their form, but in the function of what we do. And so when I think about the future library, I think about special collections. Yes, let's bring us together, and so we're all co-located. That's first among them. Um, second would be to have spaces that recognize this work that we're doing now and will be doing, not work we've done. So for that, I mean dedicated instruction space. I mean spaces that are more flexible. We, we need to have things on casters so we can move it around. We need to have spaces that um, can be changed over time, just as our profession has changed over time. Um, I think, too, we need to have more um, immediate access to robust technology. There's, there's no reason that we, we can't have iPads, um, we can't have digital displays, we can't have ways of people interacting with content in the research spaces. Um, but right now that's difficult to do. So I think you know, part of what we're just at the cusp of asking is, and also looking at the broader library project is how are the teaching, learning, and resource spaces going to be designed? And what can we learn from that for, for ourselves? And how are, are the technology spaces? What are, stu what are students doing? What do students need? These really fundamental questions, they're no different for special collections. Um, but we certainly need a space that, we can, uh, that can grow with us. Uh, not necessarily against us, which I, I think has happened, even though they're, they're both beautiful and unique in their way. So um, that's, that's a bit of how, I would, how we're talking about it. Okay, well thank you everybody for coming. I do appreciate it.